Hello, my name is Anvang Winsven, and with this presentation, I will describe the processes that are implemented in SWAT, more specifically SWAT Plus version. Within SWAT Plus, there is a strong distinction between the landscape and the water, more specifically the channels, floodplains, and the reservoirs. In my presentation, I will first talk about the landscape processes. Then I will talk about the channel and the reservoir processes. And I will end by pointing to some strengths and weaknesses of SWAT Plus. The landscape processes. The watershed system or the catchment is subdivided in SWAT in different elements. First level are the subbasins. These are identified on the basis of the topography map. Each subbasin within SWAT Plus can further be subdivided in landscape units. You may have the upland areas and the lowland areas that are identified separately. Each landscape unit can then further be subdivided in HRUs. The HRUs are very important within SWAT because it's at this level that most of the processes happen. So I will start with the, describing the processes at the HRU level. Here we have processes for hydrology, erosion, plant growth, nutrient cycling, pesticide dynamic, and agriculture management. I will focus on the hydrology. The hydrology processes happen within the profile of the soil. On top of the soil, you may have precipitation. This infiltrates and percolates through the soil. You may have evapotranspiration losses. Out of this, you may get some surface flow, lateral flow and groundwater flow. You may have percolation through the soil, which is then further going to deep losses. So very important is to calculate the fluxes, the surface flow, the lateral flow, and the groundwater flow. For the surface flow, there are two methods implemented in SWAT, but the most popular by far is a, is a curve number. For this reason, the curve number is one of the most sensitive parameters in SWAT. The curve number in this slide, CN, is used to calculate S, and S is then further used to calculate the surface runoff. There are many literature values for the curve number, and they are assigned according to soil properties and land use properties. Further, there is a dependency on wetness and slope. For this, the curve number can be further adjusted within the SWOT model. Once you know the curve number, we can calculate the surface runoff. It's quite logic. High curve numbers give high surface runoff and low curve numbers give low surface runoff. Once we know how much surface runoff we have, we also have to account for the delay, the transport through the landscape towards the river. Here is what there is also a method implemented and it's based on a numerical formula similar to the reservoir equation. Besides the curve number, other processes also very much influence the surface runoff. One of them is evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is calculated out of potential or reference evaporation. For this, there are three methods within SWOT. There is the Penmamon teeth method, which is considered as the most physically based method, but it needs a lot of data. Besides rainfall and temperature, it also needs solar radiation, relative humidity, and wind speed. We also have Priestley-Taylor method and Hargreaves methods, and they require less data. The actual evaporation depends on interception storage, which is then again 
related to leaf area index, but also to a parameter called CANMAX. Then we have transpiration from plants, which of course depends on the availability of plants through, for instance, represented through biomass, but also the root depth is of importance together with soil moisture and solar radiation. We can have sublimation directly from the soil based on soil moisture. Evaporation is very important. 62% of the precipitation uh, that falls on the continents return back to atmosphere in the form of evapotranspiration. In arid areas, this may be even a lot higher, for instance, 90%. In this slide, we show that the methods influence the results for evapotranspiration, but this also in relation to the data. We compare two methods, the PEMA Monteith, PM in black, and the Hargreaves method, HG in white. You can see that sometimes the results differ a lot. This also depends on the data that we used. So it is very important to think about the choice of the methods as well as the choice of the data. And they are related. If you have a good data set, then the penmanent teeth is likely to be the best method. But if you don't have a good data set, then maybe it's better to use a simpler method. We compared here three different data. CFRS, WATCH, which are global data sets, and we also used the weather generator. Once we have potential evapotranspiration, we can calculate actual evaporation. This depends on several aspects. First of all, you have evaporation calculated from, from interception. And this depends on the leaf area index, which again depends on the crop and the crop growth. In addition, there is this parameter CANMAX, which is specified for plants. Second, we calculate the transpiration from plants. And this is based on the availability of plants within the HRU, represented by biomass, leaf area index, but we also have a dependence of, on root depth, soil moisture and soil radiation, because these factors influence the crop growth. Finally, we have evaporation directly from the soil. This will be the highest for bare soils. Note that evapotranspiration is very important. 62% of the precipitation that falls on the continent returns back to the atmosphere in the form of evapotranspiration. In arid areas, this might become very high, like 90%. Next to surface runoff, we have the flow from the unsaturated zone, which comes in SWOT as lateral flow. The soil is what is subdivided in different layers, and each of these layers will produce some lateral flow. This will depend on the soil characteristics as well as the slope. So we have different layers, and through these layers, we have first infiltration and further percolation. But at the same time, we may have some lateral flow contributions from each layer. Once we have the percolation out of the so soil, we pro provide a volume of water, which becomes available for recharge. Finally, Another, we have another component of subsurface flow, the saturated flow. This is where groundwater flow is produced. It starts from the recharge, but then it further goes into different fluxes. Part of the recharge will go to the shallow aquifer, but part of the recharge will go to the deep aquifer. This component is a loss and will not reach the river at any point. From the recharge, we also have a component which is called revap. In the manual, it is described as capillary rise. But within the SWOT model, this component does not return to the soil, so it's another loss. The ground flow also 
has to take into account that there is a delay, and this delay can be long, days, months, years in groundwaters. For this, we have a linear reservoir equation. Uh, we ap apply it twice, once to account for the delay from percolation up to recharge, and next, there's a delay from the recharge up to the discharge of groundwater to the river. So there are two uh, linear reservoirs, and they both have their specific um, parameters. Here you can see the effect of the alpha factor on the groundwater flow. If we have a small alpha factor, we have a low flow. And if we have a high alpha factor, we have a quicker flow. In, also within SWOT, we represent the crop, crop growth. Crop growth is basically implemented on the basis of heat units. So it's driven by temperature mainly. If we reach certain heat, heat units, we may trigger, for instance, the growth of the plants, or we can also trigger the harvesting of the plants. Especially in cultivated areas, it is very important to represent the management operations. If you set up a SMOT model, there will be a default setting for this management. If you have the information and if you have a specific interest in the plants and the crop growth, then you can also implement your specific rules. Within the SWAT Plus, there are a lot of options to do this. One of the more advanced ways is to use decision tables. Within this, you can implement more or less every activity or decision that a farmer would make on his field, such as planting, tillage, fertilizer application, graze, graze, grazing, pesticide application, irrigation, very important for water consumption and hydrology, tile drainage, water impoundment, for instance, in rice areas. There are also management options for the urban areas. You can also have form ponds within your fields. These are small structures within an HRU. And it may take water from the runoff, and it may use the water, for instance, for irrigation. Very important is that each element also has an input. And this is mainly the weather. So we have inputs of precipitation temperature, solar radiation, wind speeds, and relative humidity. This can either come from measurements, but in many cases, we may not have all these measurements. And in that case, we use a weather generator, which is part of SWOT. This relies on some dis statistical descriptions of the climate. So I talked about the channel processes. Uh, so I talked about the watershed processes, and now I'm going to talk about the channel processes. The channel processes represent channel routing, transmission losses, evaporation, sediment routing, nutrient processes, and many other water quality processes and pesticide processes. It includes the main channel, but also the floodplain. It uses a simple method to compute velocity and discharge. We don't provide any cross sections in the SWOT model. There is an assumption that the channel has a trapezoidal shape. There are two ways to calculate the velocity and the discharge. It's either the variable storage routing method or the Muskingum routing method. They're both conceptual and rather simple, but they tend to work quite well. So you, it's very important that you also indicate which ones you choose, whether you use the storage routing or the Muskingum method. Besides that, there are losses such as evaporation and transmission losses. The transmission, lo the transmission losses refer to the percolation of the water through the riverbed. An important parameter in channel processes is a manning coefficient. For this, it's also important that you check whether you have a realistic value for the manning coefficient. You can refer to literature. 
Next to rivers, a very important water body are the reservoirs. Within the SWAT Plus, again, we have more flexibility compared to the SWAT model. This is also through the implementation of decision tables, where we can more specifically identify the conditions and the operations through which a, a reservoir is operated. This generally depends a lot whether it's used for flood protection, for irrigation or for both. This brings me to the end of the presentation. So there are many processes implemented in SWAT. I think that's one of the strengths. Um, it has a very comprehensive hydrological balance. It's physically based, but it also requires a lot of physically based inputs. Compared to other hydrological models, one important strength is that it has a plant growth model and that it also can calculate crop yields. There's also a nutrient cycle in the soil, and with this we can also use what for water quality problems, especially diffuse water quality problems. Another very strong element is that it's able to represent human interactions, land management and agriculture best management practices, which is very important as what is used a lot as a management tool. There are also modules to represent the urban areas and best management pr practices in these areas. At the channel level, there's in SWAT Plus a very flexible watershed configuration. Through this, it's possible to represent complex water transfers, for instance, irrigation diversions. There is a very elaborated sediment element in SWAT and SWAT Plus, as well as water quality with all the nutrients and pesticides included. We can represent different water elements, such as ponds, wetlands and reservoirs. But there are also, of course, a few weaknesses. So it is a very complex model, but it also is very demanding, demanding in data, but also potentially demanding in time. When you apply the SWOT model, especially outside of the US, you will need a calibration because not all the parameters may represent the situation and the conditions of your country. Some applications are still limited, such as applications of SWOT in tropical areas, glaciers and polars. At this moment, it's not straightforward to apply SWOT in these areas, but there's a lot of ongoing research to also make this more po possible. There are many, many processes in SWOT. In that sense, it's very complex, but most of the times the processes are very simplified. For instance, this is true for the groundwater. The groundwater is just represented through a reservoir, linear reservoir. And also the river routing is a very simple approach. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you want to find out more about what lectures, you can have a look at the glownetwork.net. Thank you very much.